Yeah, there's a very strange sense of terror that comes from knowing exactly what's going to happen to you. There's a strange sense of calm that comes from it also, but in the middle of the night when you can't sleep, sometimes you feel happy knowing what they're trying to do to you and sometimes you feel terrified knowing what they're trying to do to you. I think I'm very happy every single podcast I did previous to this, I hammered the point home and I made it very clear that they had the intention of trying to put me in jail. I said, there's three lives. They try and cancel you and slander you and destroy your name. They don't just want you to disappear from the internet. They want you to disappear from the internet in a cloud of shame. They have to shame you which is why they chose the crimes they did for me and it's why they usually choose the crimes they choose because it's heinous. They want to shame you and they want you to disappear with your head facing the ground and never pop up again. Obviously they attempted to cancel me, I became more famous than ever before. I even said to you on your podcast and I said on other podcasts, I said I think they made a mistake. I think when you have power and you overuse it, you, what happens is a rebellion. That's how a revolution starts. When you have power, you have to be very, very careful with how you use that power. The second you overuse it, there's a re revolution, like, and we're in Romania, so they know all about that. That's exactly what happens. And I, I said at the time, I think I was a mistake. I think they made a big mistake canceling me the way they did. And then the second time, the second life, which I described is they try and put you in jail for no reason. Here we are in the current scenario. I knew it was gonna happen. And the third one is they put a bullet in your head. So we're gonna have to see how the second life plays out. And yeah, I mean, when this is all over and I win the court case and I get the not guilty, I, I won't be smiling. I'll be walking out the courtroom with my head on a swivel. <laughs> That's the kind of life I'm living now. I'm going to be thinking, oh, okay, so their second attempt failed. Now what? Like, do I want to fly private anymore? <laughs> do I want to go that place anymore? Do I, you start to think about yeah. these things. Like, do I want to do these things? A lot of billionaires die, dying in plane crashes. It's strange. So it's scary regardless of how it plays out. And I guess you just have to go with the punches and, and, and see where it lands. And God has a plan for, for me and for all of us. And we're just going to see how it ends up. I want to make it very clear. And I make it clear on absolutely every single podcast. I would never kill myself. I don't care what they say. I don't care what video they show you. Never under any circumstance would I kill myself. It's haram. Never. I don't care if they put me in back in the dungeon, solitary confinement by myself for the rest of my human years. I would never kill myself ever, ever. So if that ever happens, God forbid, do not believe whatever garbage they tell you. The chance of me killing myself is precisely zero. They have to damage my influence. They have to damage my influence. They can't sit there and let me be influential because I'm saying things that they don't like me saying. And there are people sitting around going, he's saying things counter to our message and counter to our narrative. Get rid of it. And they have a pretty standardized playbook. And this is probably one of the first times in history where their playbook just isn't working. Cancel him. Still around. Oh, well, lie about him in the news. Just say he touches chicks. Well, no one believes it. Oh, all the comments are on his side. Everyone's calling us liars. Okay, then do it again. Then do it again. Make up a new girl. Then do it again. Find someone else. Yeah. And they keep attacking me with the same weapons, but the bullets are bouncing off. And that doesn't give me a sense of calm. That doesn't make me think, ha, 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 I'm invincible. It makes me think, uh-oh. <laughs> it makes me think, uh-oh, because human life is cheap at the top. Yeah. It's very cheap. It's, it's interesting. Because sometimes I analyze myself and think, why don't I just do that? Why don't I just disappear? You know, I don't need money. I don't need fame. Why don't I just disappear? And then you have to, I was saying this to my brother and he was like, well, Genghis Khan didn't need Vienna. Some people are just wired that way. <laughs> like Vienna's a long way from Kathmandu. Sometimes that's just uh, the way it is. Or Ulaanbaatar, I apologize to the capital of Mongolia. That's just the way some people are. If I see injustice, and if I see things which I believe to be false, I feel like I am obligated to say the truth. I can't explain why, even if at my own detriment. What am I doing this for? Like, it's, it's to the detriment of my life. And I've had these conversations at length with the people close to me, and, and, and we're all saying the same thing. It's always been the same way. Humanity's always been the same way. There's been a select, fault, small, few good men up against evil, and evil always outnumbers you. Evil always has more money than you. They always have more power and more influence than you. If you look at, you play any video game, when you get to the end boss, he always has more life than you. He always has more hit points, but you're the good guy. And it's kind of like, it's, it's never been any different at any point in human history. There's been the good guys up against the forces of evil, whatever they were at the time. And you've always been outnumbered and you've always been supposed to lose. Well, instead of saying who, I will say, what I will start by saying is what they do. And what they do is they control information. And we now live in an information society and by controlling information, they control how people think and act and react to things. That's all they have to do. They have to control information and they have to be very selective with what they allow you to talk about and what they allow you to discuss and what they don't. And once they can do that, they can keep you bickering about garbage and they can control the sensitive information and then they run the world. So 
having all the information controlled and having this hard barrier on what can be discussed, that's how they can purport absolute fallacies. I think now it's been a couple of years, we can probably talk about it. They psyoped the world into believing they should be afraid of the common cold. They, they psyoped the world into this. And if you think about how difficult that would be to do, how difficult would it be to sigh off the entire population of Earth? Well, what you do is you just lie on repeat and you don't allow anyone to say anything counter to it without hurting them the same way I've been hurt. And you just sigh off them. It's actually amazing because now I use that exact same sigh off on people. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. So when I sit with someone who's not matrix minded, when I sit with someone who is matrix minded, like when the BBC walked in here, I'm like, do you all have your vaccinations? Social, <laughs> <laughs> Social distancing. Did you actually 100%. <laughs> Social distancing, please. <laughs> and they look at me like I'm crazy. Well, how am I crazy? Two years ago, you were telling me to do this. Now when I repeat your own worldview to you, I'm crazy. Well, if I'm crazy, guess what? You're a fucking liar, because you lied the whole time. So either you're a liar or I'm not. You know, how could I be nuts? Put your fucking mask on. If I ever talk to any of these clowns again, they're gonna be fully masked up. And I, and I refuse, I don't care if you've had two booster jabs. No, I want all six, all six injections. I want paperwork. Or get oh, fucked. you're not coming in the house. <laughs> the I'm scared of COVID. It's dangerous. I believe the mainstream media. I'm scared. Th this word you keep using, PSYOP, I've never heard this. What, it's short for psychological operations? Correct. Break that down. What, what exactly is a PSYOP? Yeah, a PSYOP is, is, is the matrix as a whole. It's like psychological, psychological operations are constant. They constantly decide how they want you to think and what they can do to make you believe that. Right? There's a whole bunch of them they do. But it starts with tolerance. That's what I don't like about this whole guise of tolerance. It's not that I'm an intolerant person. It's not that I'm a bad person. It's not that I want to hurt other people. But when they keep pushing tolerance, what they're trying to say is have no standards or barriers or parameters for anything. That's what they want. You have to be tolerant. Tolerant of what? Tolerant of having your shop set on fire. Tolerant of your kids being taught things you don't want. Tolerant of crime. Tolerant of your house being broken. Like, tolerant of what? You're not allowed any hard barrier or any hard parameters as a man anymore. That's why they push tolerance. That's the beginning of it. That's the first stage. Once you accept absolute tolerance, well then it's the end, isn't it? I'm tolerant of everything. I'll eat the bugs. You'll sure. You'll tolerate everything. I'll tolerate everything. I'm tolerant. Sure. So when I, I say things like I'm intolerant of certain things and people think that's bad. No, you need to have standards and parameters. And that's one of the reasons they also attack me. I, I say that men should be allowed to have standards and parameters in a relationship and in their lives. We should be allowed to decide who we want to marry and we should have standards for her. They have standards for us, we should allow ourselves to have standards for her. We should have standards in what we'll accept from a government, and standards in what we'll accept from a police force. We should have standards as men. But they're trying to erode all of that, because once that's gone, then your brain is completely empty. And then once your brain's empty, they can just plug in the slave program, and then, then it's over, right? You're, to you're a tolerant person. You're a tolerant person. Good. You're a good slave. Slaves are exceptionally tolerant. They're, they're good for different things, man. Mm. But um, they both have the same basic the same basic worldviews, the same basic, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Propaganda. Propaganda. The same, they're trying to hypnotize you in the same way, right? And it's all done on purpose. I think we've discussed this before and we'll discuss it certainly a bit later, but they're trying to destroy the masculine imperative to prevent revolution. So it's all kind of the same. There's certain things I respect about each country, um, but it was good to certainly at a young age move around a bit as well. It, it allowed me to never ever really settle in a school and make a bunch of good friends or anything like that so i always understood even from a young age how to make people like me quickly and also how unimportant the relationships from those people were right i wasn't a kid who's like oh i'm gonna miss my best friend i was like okay you're my best friend for two years peace i'm out i was like that so that's probably another reason why me and my brother are so close so yeah it was a good upbringing i can't have nothing bad to say about it but i was just raised by the og my dad was a g big black chess master huge Drinking, gambling, pimping. Like, he's just out here. He was just that guy, right? <laughs> so he was like that to the end. So he was a hero. Yeah. So chess, I mean, obviously my father was a chess master, right? So I had to I had to learn the game. He sat me down. I spent a lot of time learning it. And to this day, I have massive respect for chess. So much respect for the game. It's so much harder at that world level than people can even fathom. Unless you even play the game, you can't even anticipate how good these people are at the game. They're, they're effectively computers. I don't think you can even be good at chess at that level without having something a little bit wrong with you. You gotta be on the spectrum somewhere. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because it's crazy how good these guys are. But yeah, chess is an amazing thing. I still play chess every day. I'm, I'm not world level or anything. I'm around 1750, 1800 ELO. Um, if anyone knows chess, that's what I am. But yeah, it, it would that be considered uh, better than average? High, high certainly, team? certainly better than average. Yeah. You know, it's, the average player, let's say, is around a thousand or something. Okay. But okay. my dad was twenty four hundred. Okay. Twenty five hundred. Damn. Okay. So yeah, so 
I'll give you an example. My dad could beat me without looking at the board. So my dad would be in the kitchen, fucking around the kitchen, cooking dinner. I'd be in front of a chessboard in the living room, and I'd say E4. He'd say C C6. My <laughs> F3, Knight C3. God and boom, and he'd smoke me without looking at the board. That's how good Shit. the best. It's, it's, it's insanity. Yeah. But um, I do think it's a good basis for life. There's certainly a lot of lessons in chess. There's certainly a lot you can attribute to chess from from everyday life to the chessboard. And I think it's a good it's a good grounding mechanism. I enjoy to sit down for a good couple hours, win some games, lose some games. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll give you my favorite one first. Yeah. Please do. My favorite one is, is the difference between the king and the queen. Mm. Right? Because the king moves one square at a time. And the queen can just zip across the board. Right? So you're here in Miami. You're partying in Miami. They've got all these parties right now. It's Art Basel, blah, blah, blah. You see all these chicks on a boat. For the man to get on that boat, it's one square at a time. Right? He has to get a good job. He has to get his taxes right. He has to find a way to leverage credit. He has to meet the guy who sells the boats. He has to go through all this shit stage by stage by stage to finally pull off being on that yacht and having that yacht at the age of 56. A chick, what does she need? Lip fillers? <laughs> Boom. Zip. On. She gets straight on. That's the difference between the king and the queen. But although the king is slower than the queen, he's the most important piece, right? The king can't die. The queen can die. The queen, sometimes you can be looking at a position and go, this is fucked up. The only way out of this is to sacrifice that bitch. Mm. Sometimes you can do it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a very quick story. This is a story I've never told before. When I was, how old was I? 23? When I was 23, I was dating a ballerina. She was the prima ballerina of the Cambridge Ballet School in England. And I had no money. I was a fighter, but I was coming up. I didn't really have any money. And she lived far away, like an hour and a half away, but she used to come see me and we were good for like a year, year and a half. I love this girl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, she finished ballet school. She started dancing in clubs in London. She couldn't get any ballet work. So surprise, surprise. Who fucking was ballet work, right? So she ends up doing like dancing and uh, not stripping, but like dancing in the club, you know. Da -da. So now she's around all the, mo the London money every day. She's out dancing all the time. She's up late every night. She doesn't want to drive an hour and a half to come see me. None of this shit. So we're kind of falling apart a little bit. And uh, she ended up talking to someone famous, David Hay. I don't know who he is. He's a boxer. Mm -hmm. So David Hay starts texting this bitch, right? Back and forth to the... So anyway, when I finally saw her again, she was like, we had an argument. She's like, well, you know what? You think you're a fighter? This guy, that guy, this guy, that guy. I'm like, look, if you're going to go fuck idiots, at least do it for money. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, if you're going to go fuck idiots, at least get paid because they don't give a fuck about you. Like, if you're going to play this game, at least do it for money. Right. So I had this argument with her back and forth and I explained to her that these men are just going to use you. If you're going to do it, at least get paid. And when she left the house, Tristan said, why are you telling her to fuck other dudes? I'm like, no, I'm just understanding that in my chess position, I've lost this game. Right. Mm. The game is done now. Just sooner or later, she's out. All we do is argue. She's in the club every night. I'm just trying to say before she leaves, maybe I can get a little bit of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's the queen sacrifice, right? Right, right. She, we, we broke up three months later. I don't know if she fucked him or not or who she fucked. I don't know. I never spoke to her since. But that's kind of the, the analogy you have to be able to apply to life. Sometimes chicks got to go. Yeah. Sometimes they have to go to save the king. And uh, too many dudes, most of the time, men truly lose at life. It's because they've attached themselves to a queen and they won't let her up. They won't sacrifice her. No, no matter what. I promised I'm going to stick by you. This, our marriage vows, no matter what, no matter what. And they just stay on that sinking ship till she eventually leaves his ass. Even worse, what most queens do, queens, I don't want to use queens, what most women do nowadays, especially in the West, yeah. I see women getting their men in trouble all the time. Do you know how many times I've seen chicks start in fights for their dude to have to mop up? My man's gonna be, be, be. And yep. the man's like, oh, fucking shut up, man. Yep. There's, there's four of them. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Like, even if he's a big dude, he's like, I don't really need this now today. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Man, I, I, another story. I have so many stories in my life. My life's been cool. <laughs> Back around the same time, I'm 22, 23 years old, kickboxer. I was British champion. I wasn't world champion at the time. It was four in the morning. The club just ended. I was in a chicken and chip shop. It's an English thing. They sell like fries and fried chicken and, and they're open 24 hours. Like, yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. And there's a long line. Uh, an Audi with tinted windows pulls up. These three big black guys get out, push it straight in front of the whole line, go straight up to the front, cut in front of five people and start ordering. My girl goes to me, we've been waiting here ages. I said, shut the fuck up. <laughs> shut the fuck up. She goes, are you just going to let them push it? I said, shut the fuck up. So I made her be quiet, right? Anyway, the man, two two in front of me not this guy the guy here he couldn't tell this bitch to shut up she's like excuse me excuse me there's a line and the guy turns around and goes you think i don't see the fucking line i don't care about a fucking line so she starts running her mouth bro this dude knocked her the fuck out oh man whack clean out cold by the time her man looked at her and looked back up 
boom, spark, done. Whoa. Both of them. And I stood there and watched both of them just laid out clean. Yeah, fatalities, bruv. It was, it was, I wouldn't be surprised if they both had permanent damage. It was bad. The, the three dudes who ordered the chicken and chips didn't even take their food. They started laughing, walked back out, got in the car. And I turned around and said to my girl, you see, some people are just ready to fucking go to jail. Some people are ready to kill people over fucking nothing. You want me to fight? Oh yeah, I can fight. But what am I fighting these three dudes for? What fries? Yeah. What fries in a ten minute delay? Damn, man. And this is what bitches will get you into this shit. Yeah. Bitches will get you into this shit fast. And that's why when I see dudes saying, "Oh yeah, she's just my friend," you're hanging around with girls, and they're not even giving you pussy, and they might get your ass killed. What the fuck is wrong with you, with man? Girls are a liability. They're a liability to have around you because you have a duty to protect them in some regard. I curate my experience very, very carefully. Any woman I'm around, I understand I have to protect. So she better suck something. <laughs> I ain't fucking sitting around being friends with no bitch. Because I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen so many men have their ass kicked over chicks. It's, inc it's incredible. 100%, man. They're, they're, they're a liability. And, and it's not necessarily just completely their fault. Yeah. But if you're rolling with a chick who won't shut up and you tell her to shut up, you need to be careful, man. And, and Myron nailed it. There's a big difference between fighting and violence. Yeah. Like, I'm a professional fighter, right? I know how to fight. But fighting and violence are different things. Yeah. If I wanted to get violent on somebody, I'd just run them the fuck over. Like, that's forget fighting. Right? If someone, if somebody who hurt my family was on the sidewalk, I'm not going to get out and fight the guy. I'm just going to just run him over my fucking truck. We'll talk about violence. Because if you rely on the government for food stamps, then you can't argue with the government, can you? So that's what they want. So anyone who believes in the matrix and believes in media and believes in the lies they're told, anyone who sits there and goes, that's true, that it's literally designed to make you broke. That's why it's all a scam. Do your GCSEs, do your A-levels, get in debt, go to uni, get out, get a shit job, get a mortgage. Don't worry, when you've paid that mortgage off when you're 61, then you'll have enough money to go to Spain for holiday. Then your pension comes. Oh, government doesn't have the pension money anymore. Funny enough, hedge fund stole it. Oops, de doops. <laughs> and then you wake up one day and go, whoa, I just got fucked. So the whole scam, the whole story is a lie because they want you broke. <laughs> they don't want you rich. If you're rich, you won't listen to them. So all of it's a fucking lie. And intrinsically, we all know this, right? If I, when I pull up, in one of my 30 cars to a gas station and people look at me and they see a Lambo or a Ferrari or a Bugatti or a Koenigsegg, whatever I'm driving, nobody goes, wow, he went to school. No, they think drug dealer, gangster. They're thinking, they're thinking he broke the rules because anyone who follows the rules doesn't get shit. <laughs> it's all a scam, it's all a fucking lie. So the slave minds are fucked, but those are the only ones who are too stupid to make money. Anybody who understands that the Matrix is lying to them is smart enough. So very few, very small percent are too stupid. Inside of our school, at the height of it, before the Matrix attack, we're relaunching now, we had 175,000 students. Wow. When we had 175,000 students, maybe 2,000 we kicked out for being too stupid. It's step by step. Do this, do that, do this, and don't be lazy. Fuck, it's not that hard, right? So stupid's not the problem. So we have people who are lazy, very few are stupid, but the majority, the main reason most people are broke is because they are arrogant. I will sit here and say all the things I've said. I will do this, take time out of my life for free. Somebody at home will watch and digest it for free. They will agree with the things that are being said or at least be entertained enough to continue to watch. And then I'll say, I'll teach you how to make money online. CobraTake.com, you can join the real world. And they'll sit there and go, nah, I'll do it myself. They're arrogant. They have these egos from fuck knows where because they didn't earn it. And they're just too arrogant to listen to anybody. I became world champion by listening to my coach. I didn't become world champion by walking in and saying, I'll do it myself. <laughs> it's not how you get anywhere in life. You have to listen. If, if Mike Tyson were to walk in or if Elon Musk were to walk in here and talk to me about money, I wouldn't be sitting there going, I can do that. I'd be like, oh, Mr. Elon, richest man in the world. Hello, very nice to meet you, please. Even though I already understand I don't want to launch a car brand or put rockets in space, please, you must know some things I don't know. How do you deal with the currency fluctuations? Does, it does, does inflation impact how much it costs for you to send a rocket into space? Like, I'd ask him something that's useful, right? But some, some people are so brutally arrogant that they'll sit here and they'll listen to all the things I say, and they'll agree that I'm intelligent, they'll agree I'm actually successful, but they'll sit there and go, yeah, but you know what? I'll, I'll do it myself. I don't want to join that school. You know, I'll, just do, I'll do it myself. They're arrogant. Everybody's fucking arrogant. I sit with people who I used to go to school with from Luton who are still broke and tell them how to make money. And you know what they do? They answer back. 
Yeah, but you know, it's not that simple because you know, the wife gets the kid, da, 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 and you know what? And I, I don't like to do things that way, the way I like to work. The way you like to work is why you're fucking broke. So what the fuck are you talking about? You just sat here and wasted 10 minutes of my time. I told you how to take your business of painting and decorating or whatever the fuck you're doing and make a serious amount of money and now you're telling me the way you like to work? Then stay fucking broke. The fuck you want me to do? What level of arrogance? But this is people. They'll sit with a multi-millionaire and tell you their view. Oh, I think that the... Know when you're out qualified and accept it and learn. So we all do. I'm not gonna get... A, I can't play piano for shit. The piano teacher walked in here and said, this is what you do. And I said, well, I like to move my hands this way. What kind of dumbass? But this is the, this is the arrogance people operate under. So I'd say 20% of people are lazy, 20 to 25%. A large portion of the world are not lazy. They're actually working exceptionally hard, but they're doing the wrong thing. 5% of people are too stupid. So say 25%, 5% is 30%. But 70% of people are brutally arrogant and this is why they are poor. That's the truth. Good question. I've talked about this already. It was an unorthodox strategy. I've talked about it at length, so I won't give the whole story because it's too long. But I identified a gap. I identified a market. I approached the scenario and the situation extremely professionally. And I worked exceptionally hard. I made my first million dollars, so I what my first millions came from owning a webcam studio. So I saw a little advertisement in the corner of a webpage saying, talk to live girls now. I've never been a porn guy, I'm not interested in that shit, but I was like, that's interesting. I know some girls who need some money. Boom, boom, boom. I put together this apparatus, extremely professional. No fucking sexual misconduct, no Dan Bilzerian, no threesomes, nothing. Very oh, professional. If it's pre down. <laughs> very professional outfit. And I used all my business knowledge and all my life knowledge, and I applied it. I worked 22 hour days, I would say. I got to the point where I was so tired, so tired, that I said, you know what, give me 20 minutes. And if the alarm, if I could hear the alarm go off, I'd get up. Sometimes I just slept clean through it and I slept an hour or two. For months and months and months, and I built an empire. I built an insanely large empire at one point. I'm completely out of that business now, but how did I how do as in, did you sell it? Uh, I didn't sell it, I just closed it all down, I moved on. I started making a bunch of money and I found other opportunities. But how did I get that opportunity? Perspicacity, first thing I said, pay attention. I paid attention, I looked at the girl. <coughs> I'll give you the coffee shop example. This is what I did, I clicked on that advert, I saw the girl sitting there, miserable, waiting for a customer. I thought nobody's gonna buy from an unhappy bitch. You need, these men are, the men who are paying her are trying to escape an unhappy life or they wouldn't be doing this shit. So when I got my girls online, Smile, happy girls get paid. That was a token, that was a slogan. Happy girls get rich. Joking, ha ha ha. Who's you gonna pay? You're gonna pay the girls like, yeah, yeah, having a, having a blast. So I paid attention to the competition. I saw an opportunity, just at the coffee shop. So all the things they did wrong, the room was messy, camera quality was shit, just the basic stuff. The way the girl acted and interacted, all that stuff. And I applied it all by paying attention countless hours watching everybody else, finding the way to do it better. So I quit the coffee shop and I did it better. So I was absolutely not only really perspicacious and that's, that's how you make money. And I did it with that, but I could have done it with anything. And now I do it with everything. The story of me sending a text message via my network and having a coffee shop is a true story. I have never, I don't think I've even, I've been in there maybe twice. <laughs> I don't even go. <laughs> and, and, I have mechanisms in place to make sure I'm not robbed too badly because unfortunately a little bit of cash goes missing. But everything's in, in place and it makes me money. I don't think I've even drunk my own coffee. So I identified, I put together a list. It needs to be like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. I have competent people who work for me, which is very hard to find, but I do. They understand to follow the doctrine to the doctrine and I'm getting money into a bank account. That's it. And you can do that with literally anything if you have a strong network and you pay attention. You can do it with anything, even podcasts. We're doing a podcast right now. You guys are already big and successful at this. I'm telling you, you can look at the biggest podcasts in the world and still see what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. Mm. It's just a game. Mm. That's the game. And then you have to outcompete everybody else. So you made a very interesting point there. You just said on the face of it appear to be blatantly misogynistic. Mm. I understand that on the face of some of the long format content I've made, if you're going to take a few seconds out of hours, chop it up, put it all over social media, accompany with my massive fame, then things can absolutely not be taken out of context. 
I do not hate women in any regard. I have no negative relationship with women. No women have come forward saying I've hurt them. I have no criminal record for hurting women. There's no way I can be seen as the face or the devil in regards to how men treat women on, on, on the planet. I'm absolutely not the opposite. I believe in protecting and providing. I've been misunderstood. There's been large contingents of people who have tried very hard to purport lies about me. And, and the, the truth of the matter is, I've, I've been producing content for a very long time. Hours and hours of videos been cut down to two or three seconds of clip. Those clips have gone viral and people misunderstand me. Yeah, so the point I was making was obviously at the height of the Me Too scandal. And also if we look at Amber Heard and Johnny Depp, there's been a lot of high profile cases where men have been accused of things they did not do without evidence. And their lives have been completely and utterly destroyed. Right. When I say these things, people sit and say that, oh, he hates women. I don't hate women. I think rape is disgusting. I would take a stronger stance on rape than the British government. I think these people should face the death penalty. But to sit and say that women without evidence can go forward and just make up accusations against men, even though they've been repeatedly proven to destroy men's lives at will. I, I, Completely. I'm not going to sit here as a professional and say that I can't be taken out of context. What I will say is that one small sentence you've taken was from a one hour video where I explained that, of course, rape is disgusting. Of course, everybody should be punished for their crimes regardless of when they happen. But people are not perfect, male and female. And if you give women the opportunity to destroy men's lives without evidence, there's going to be a contingent of women who will do that. I'm trying to make a balanced and nuanced argument in a world where people have no intention span. They're going to take a few seconds, put it online, decide someone's good or bad, not be interested in the longer format video. And here I am. No, I'm certainly a person who takes personal responsibility. That's who I am as a person. But we live in a world now with TikTok videos five or six seconds long, there's no content. Because I made a religious point. I said that when a man marries a woman, the woman's father walks him down the aisle, walks her down the aisle and hands her away to the man. Traditionally, this is what it says in the Bible. I'm a religious person. I believe in God. I live in the world. I think my sister is my her husband's property, yes. When a bride is walking down the aisle to marry the groom, the father walks next to her and gives her away, true or false? It, I, perhaps the way that that, the reason, I'm asked that question repeatedly and I'm asked in a loaded way. And so would you rephrase what you said there? Now what, that's, that's an interesting point about phrasing. The way I would say things before I was famous, mm. I have to take personal responsibility and accept right. that if I make a video that 500 people see and 1% of them misunderstand it, that's not a problem. If I make a video that 5 million people see and 1% of them understand it. So specifically on that point, I think my sister is her husband's property. She took his last name. She mm. she married him. She wanted to join his family. She has so said he, it herself. Right, so she... she She's still a sovereign individual. Listen, my friend, if we want to argue about this, we need to go back to the Bible, to the Quran. You need to argue with religious... No, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about any, anything in the Bible or Quran. I'm but that's what you, it says. No, no, I'm asking you what you think. I think that if a woman marries a man and she decides to take his last name, that they have different roles and responsibilities within that marriage, and I believe that... That's not the question. She's hand... I believe don't, the father... Don't behave, Andrew, I am. The, don't the behave father like, hands her... Don't behave like a politician. The father hands her when to you, the man. Right, but don't be a politician, because I think you're a straight talker, sure. right? You keep telling me you're a straight talker. I think my sister is her husband's property. Do you regret saying it like that? I, I understand that with my newfound fame, perhaps it could be phrased differently. However, I still believe that a woman is given to the man in marriage. That's what I believe. Yeah, but, I, but that's the way that people ask me the question. People say to me, they ask the oh, question. Oh, hey, you can't blame people for asking you questions. Surely, if you want to be accountable for what sure. you've said, you've got to own your responses. Don't, the, don't blame the question. I own the response. Let me ask you a question okay. now and you say something and then say, well, I shall blame you for asking. I understand, Piers. Piers, I understand. I believe the woman is given to the man. I believe she's given away by the father. I believe she belongs to the man. So you she do, belongs to so the fundamentally, man. All right. So fundamentally, you do believe that a woman becomes a man's property at I marriage. believe she belongs to the man in marriage, correct? Right. Then let me make it very, very clear to the camera. I believe a woman is given to the man in, in marriage. I believe that. I also believe a man has a duty to protect and provide for her. I believe a man should lay down his life if something happens or his wife's life is threatened. I believe that me, when, women and children first are on the light boat, lifeboats. But men, I believe that men. Like, but a man I, doesn't own a woman. It's not. No. It's, okay. Unless they literally buy them as a slave. Well, obviously we're not talking about that. We're talking about religious biblical marriage. We're talking about something else. I understand that very well, Piers. Which That's is why, why people think you're a misogynist. Completely. I understand all of this very well, which is why when you're saying I was backtracking, I'm not. I'm Do you have any regret, though, over the way you phrase this stuff? Well, this is the point I was trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is when I was not nearly as famous and I was making long format content, I was not sitting there anticipating I'd become the most Googled man on the planet and that a few seconds could be taken out of context. That was not my anticipation. No, but it's still what plan. you believe. It's what you believe now. So what's the difference? It's not about, it's not, you're asking me, you're saying that young people who are impressed. If you said to me, look, look, Piers, honestly, I've had time to think about this and I wish I hadn't said it, I don't believe that. That's one thing. Actually, you've said the opposite. You said, actually, that's what I think, yeah. I think that when a... So it's a it doesn't really matter whether you recorded it when you're famous or not famous. It's what you actually believe, right? I believe that a man has a duty to protect and provide for a woman. 
I believe that a, a woman's father gives her away to the man. That's what I believe, and that's in, in my marriage, that's that's the circumstance I'm going to live under. If, if people want to live in a different scenario, that's completely theirs, their, their prerogative. You, you went on to say about authority over women. If I have a responsibility over it, I must have a degree of authority. Yeah. For the same reason, if I have responsibility over and people are going to use their mind, it's an example, an analogy, responsibility over a child, I have to have some authority. Yeah. So you, you believe as part of your ownership or your property of, of the woman, you have authority over her. No, I believe if you have responsibility. That's what you said. I believe if you have responsibility over something, you have to have a degree of authority you can't be responsible. Yeah, but authority means, again, that you're the boss. The point I'm making, if you'll please let me finish sure. at this point. The point I was trying to make was talking about the safety of a woman. Mm. She was walking alone at night, and I was saying, well, I wouldn't let my woman walk alone at night. Mm. And they said, well, you're not in charge of her. You don't get to decide what she does. I said, I understand, but if I'm responsible for her safety, and I'm the person who's burdened with making sure she is safe. I have to have the authority to say, don't put yourself in unsafe situations. The two things are linked. Well, you don't, you don't have authority. You have the, you can absolutely have the right to say to the woman you're with, I don't think you should, but ultimately- If she but, decides, then but, I can't force her. Right, so course. authority implies that you have the ability to control someone. No, authority this. believes, uh, the authority implies that I have the moral right to sit and say that that's an irresponsible thing to do and I'm responsible that's for- That's not what authority means. Well, I'm, I'm not gonna, if you think I'm gonna lock somebody up in their room, if that's, is that what you're implying? No, I just think, I don't think you know what authority means. I know what it means. I'm saying that if well, I have- a different description of if, what authority If means. I have responsibility for her safety, then I have to have the authority, authority to tell her not to do unsafe Yeah, things. but authority means that you have some form of control over this woman. I, I think you're trying to, what you're trying to I'm do- I'm only trying to get to what you think. Honestly, okay. I am. Uh, I come with no agenda here at all. I understand. And I'm explaining very, very clearly. Mm. If I have responsibility over said subject, I have to have authority over it. So let me say you have children, right? Right. You have responsibility for them. No, I have, I have legal authority over my children. That is very different to having legal authority over my wife or my female partner. Completely, but the point I'm trying to make- So you accept that? I, I accept that you- Because you use the analogy of responsibility for a child. My friend, these are, these are very- These are actually really important things. They're important things, but you, introdu you, introdu you interrupt me every five seconds. So it's hard for me to actually explain my point. The point I'm making here is very simple. You have children and you're responsible for their safety. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have authority to say, don't go out at night perhaps because you want them to be safe. I have legal authority. You have a legal authority, yeah. legal authority. I'm saying that if I had a woman and the, the question where you've raised this soundbite from, mm. I was asked about protecting a woman, making sure she's safe. Mm. And I would say, I wouldn't want her to go out at night on her own because I'm responsible for her safety. Mm. And someone said, well, you don't have authority over to do that. And I said, well, no, I can't force her to stay inside. But if she were to ask me, how do I protect myself at night? I would say, well, you should stay inside. That's right. how you should do that's, it. I don't have an issue with what So we agree. Said. No, no. It's the semantics. No, it's not, it's not semantics. And this is where I don't, don't think you quite get why there's a furore over what you say. With respect. Because the semantics point would be if we're saying the same thing in different ways, but we're not. I'm saying to you that when you say I have to have some authority over a woman, I say to you, you have no right to any authority over a woman. You do over a child if it's your child because you are the legal appointed guardian of that child. Understood. You're not a legally appointed guardian or authority over your wife or female partner. Legally appointed, absolutely not. I agree. However, when it comes to things like personal responsibility or personal safety, men, largely by society, are accepted. We're the protectors and providers. We can sit here and pretend that in the world we live in, if me and my wife were walking down the street and men were to come up and try and attack us, I wouldn't be the one fighting. But we both know in reality, I would. Right. I have a degree I of I, I have a degree of responsibility to protect her. So if I have a degree of responsibility to protect her physically, then the point I'm trying to make is, I will do my best to make sure she's never putting herself in unsafe unsafe situations. You wish situations. you hadn't used the word she, authority. She, the authority is something that she would give to me. She would come to me and say, so is, but, how, do, how can I make sure no, I'm as safe on. as okay. possible? But I don't want to interrupt you. I just want to point out that's not what authority means. If someone gives, you can, a person can give Voluntary authority. Voluntary authority is not authority. Uh, no, but that's the point. If it's a not. Woman, Pierce, if Andrew, a, stop. Pierce, if a woman comes to me and says, I want you to keep me safe, she is handing me authority for her safety. Completely, I never said One I, is consensual and one isn't. But why are we pretending I do unconsensual things? Because you no literally say, I must have a degree of authority. I have to have some authority. And the point about- Only if I'm responsible for her safety. If I'm not responsible for her safety, position, I don't have authority. If your position now is that with her permission, I would like to have authority when we go out at night to protect her, that's a different That was thing. always my position. But that's not what you said. But that was always my position. So, so again, I simply say to you, do you- It do you is what I said. Though. Do you wish you'd phrased it a different way? No, because we're talking about long format copy where I'm talking about a woman who has come to me and said, you're responsible for making sure I'm safe. I said, well, then I have to make the decisions. When an 18 year old boy reads, I must have some authority over a woman. What do you think he thinks? Well, I understand that 
and I said this earlier when you tried to say I was backtracking, which I'm not doing. I no, no, actually, I'm not. I don't want to. Okay. I'm not trying to gotcha you. Cool. I'm trying to work out exactly what you. I understand. Think. With massive fame comes massive responsibility. I understand that a percentage of the population are always going to take everything that's said by anybody out of context. Would you change the wording of what you said? No, I would just encourage people to watch my long format copy and understand. Would it fully. you tell an 18 year old boy you don't have? authority over women. Absolutely. Uh, you would unless, say that. Unless a woman comes to him and says, you're responsible for my safety, please make sure keep me safe. Like I see, woman that Andrew Tate, I can sign up to. Well, then we agree. Yeah, but I don't agree with what you said before. Because you're taking a sound bite from a two-hour Yeah, but you haven't been taken out of context because I read you the entire sentence. It's very- Well, you've ignored different. all the context around the sentence, my friend. You can't ignore a sentence that says, I must have a degree of authority. But you can when the, there's a two hour conversation where a woman is telling me if she makes me responsible for her safety and me explaining, well, if I'm responsible for your safety, I have the authority to make decisions. So do, yes, do you, you've ignored they, all the context. Do you respect women? Absolutely. Why wouldn't I? Do you think that 18, 19 year old women are more attractive than 25 year old women? I think there's attractive people. Uh, that's, that's a loaded question. I don't know. Well, it's not really, is it? I, I can't you know sit, why I'm asking it. Of course I do, but I can't sit well, here and for say... For the benefit of viewers who don't know why I'm asking, you said this. In general, this is also one of the reasons men find youth attractive. You want to block the internet? I'll block the internet right effing now. The reason 18 and 19-year-olds are more attractive than 25-year-olds is because they've been through less dick. People say, oh, you can't say that, but yes, I can. A 19-year-old is more attractive than a 26-year-old woman, and I'll tell you why. Because that 26-year-old has talked to more guys, been to the club more times, been effed and dumped more times, more arguments, more mess, more for me to clean up. That is misogyny. Why? Because you are encouraging a mindset about 25-year-old women that makes them sound out to be infinitely less desirable than 18, 19-year-olds and having effectively been having too much sex to be taken in a more respectful way. That would, well, firstly, even if that was the case, that wouldn't be misogyny. But well, what did you mean by what you said? That's not misogyny because it's not anti-women. I'm, I'm saying that an 18 or a 19 year old woman would be more desirable. It's pretty anti-25 like year old women. Anti-25 year old women we can argue, but not misogyny. Well, that's misogyny. That's, that's, no, 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 it's not. Well, being anti any woman at all is misogyny. Not when, I'm, not when I'm saying that women are beautiful and attractive at a certain age and saying that age You're is saying 18, 19 year olds are more attractive than 25 Well, then ageist perhaps, but misogynistic absolutely is that not. Is that but you just accepted it was misogyny. No, I didn't. You said it was more misogyny. I'm telling you, no, it's not. So you don't think if you're saying slightly hateful things about her. That's not slightly old. hateful. Well, it is. You it's, think you, you'd say that to a woman's face if she's 25? It's not slightly hateful. When so you're, you would go up to a 25-year-old woman and tell her exactly what I just read. Why out. would I walk up to a random 25-year-old woman? Because you said it in public on the that. internet and it's been listened to and watched by millions and millions of young, Correct. impressionable boys. Correct. There was a large panel. There was a conversation. Right. There was hours long of conversation. There were feminists attacking men for toxic masculinity and attacking me and saying things. And I said things back, which we're going to attack. But I think, on. see, I'm, I so think, which you've done yourself a, a bunch of times. I think a lot of allegations of toxic masculinity are not toxic. Correct. I do think that kind of uh, sentence that I just read out that, that paragraph is actually toxic. If you genuinely mean that. And you say you wouldn't say it to a woman's face, but you said it in public about women of that age. I do think that's misogynist. And I think you probably do too. I don't think it's misogynistic. I understand why it can be insulting. You wouldn't say it to a woman's face. I'd say, well, it depends. You're making out like I'm walking around the street going up to random 25 Well, if they do, you're doing it to tens of millions of people online. There's no difference. Not at all. We're discussing a topic. We were discussing the, the ideal age of a man. Should, should young boys, right, in their teens, are you comfortable that they would have that mindset? Be I honest. I think that young boys in their teens lack life experience, they lack nuance, and they need to be very, very careful what they're digesting online, whether it's my content or anybody else's, who protect and provide for the people close to them, are fantastic for the economy, and we're, and I'm not, I'm certainly not the worst influence out here, Piers. You have little Nas twerking on the devil on music videos, which our children are digesting. You have uh, drill artists singing about stabbing people to death in the middle of a knife crime epidemic. You have rabid uh, psychopaths on whether the right or the left announcing violence on the other side. You have all these insanities in the world. And because I sit here and say, I, yeah, perhaps, now you've, you've laid it out and it offended you, I understand. Me I didn't say it offended Okay, cool. I just read you the things. You read things that you said they could be offensive and some people are offended. Well, some people definitely were offended. Absolutely. That's fine. And, I, and honestly, I think some of the things you said were genuinely offensive and misogynist. Okay, so they offended you. I, like actually, I, so like I said earlier, so they offended you, no, which is on. fine. I said they offended you, you interrupted me, and now you're saying they offended you, which is fine. And the, but the point I'm trying to make is this, I'm not the devil. 
There are certainly worse people than me. And I don't disagree and they exist. with that. And, and I'm saying that my core tenets for the people who don't understand me are self-accountability, mm -hmm. so I'm accountable for everything I've ever said. My core tenets are responsibility, so I'm responsible for everything I've said. My core tenets are traditional masculinity to a degree, which involves protecting and providing for women. And I'll make another point, another point here that's very, very, that's very, that needs to be said. The number of women who have stood up and stuck up for me is ignored. Thousands of women are making videos saying, I've met Andrew Tate, he's such a nice guy. I wish I had a man like Andrew Tate who felt responsible to protect and provide for me. You know what? I, I do belong to my husband. That's why I married him and I love him. We ignore the thousands of women who stood up and, and, and stood by me and said everything I said is true. And we're taking a very vocal minority who have taken the things I've said and are pretending to be absolutely and utterly devastated by them okay. for some reason. Yeah, I'll see what you're uh, that's the first thing. Yeah, it's, it is nothing to do with me. Uh, the fact that a 14-year-old girl took her life is truly sad. The world we live in today is... The world we live in... The, the fact that something like that happened is almost mind-blowing to me. That's truly, that's truly sad. I actually feel sad inside to see something like that. This fact that... And I became world champion for the first time. How was that for you? It was good, but you know, like, I don't ever feel like I'm satisfied. I never, like, won the world title and go, yes, I'm the champ now. Mm -hmm. It's just like, okay, next. Next, next. I was, I was kind of always like that. I always had these aspirations. I've always kind of felt, without sounding like a crazy conspiracy theorist, even now to this day, I feel. Maybe, correct me, you're a smart man. So maybe this will make sense to you. Do you ever look around you and just look at the world and feel like, kind of like we're in the matrix, like there's something missing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just you feel it in your gut. Yeah, something isn't right here. Like yeah. everything just seems so superficial. And I, I don't know, I was always looking for this secret. I was always looking for, I wouldn't say happiness or contentment, but I was always looking to try and break out of the nine to five, just the normal monotony of day-to-day -day life. And, 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 I, and for a long time, I thought fighting was my way out. I don't know what I was trying to get to. I don't know where it was gonna lead. But when I just look at the normal life a lot of people live, that is just absolutely depressing to me. Yeah. Like, I couldn't imagine doing it. I'm not shitting on the normal guy. I'm saying you're a stronger man than me. Cause if I was a normal dude working in Starbucks, Bro, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that day to day. I literally could not do that. And I thought fighting will make sure I never have to do that, if that makes sense. Did you ever find this sense of completion while you winning world titles or were you still unsatisfied? There's always someone new to beat up, right? Yeah. And then even then, you're de I de I'm dedicating all my time to fighting, which is actually the reason I retired. I retired for four years. I came back last year and I fought three times. But uh, I actually retired because one day I woke up and I looked at my life and I thought, I'm giving seven hours a day to fighting. If I were to put seven hours a day into something else, what else could I achieve? Because I had a little bit of money from fighting, but I wasn't balling. I wasn't rich, rich. And I thought, what's the point of being the world champion if I can't buy Lambos on the debit card, right? What's the point? So then I thought, well, I want to be rich now. So that's, that's actually the reason I retired. So I was always chasing other things. And then now I've got money, I want to fight again. I'm, I'm never happy, bro. This is how it goes, right? You're always chasing something else. But I do feel like to a degree, I have at least partially escaped the matrix I used to be talking about. I, I kind of feel like I've started to escape. And Corona, as much as it's been a headache for everybody, has helped me realize how fortunate I am in my position. To When everyone else is locked down, I can just get on a private jet and go where I want, right? So that, it's kind of cool when they go, there's no flights. I'm like, not for you. <laughs> there's flights for me, bro. So it, it, it's kind of, I have, I felt like I've semi-escaped. So I've, I've kind of gone. Yes. Let's talk about the webcam business, yeah. yes. So that, that's the story. So for anyone watching this who doesn't know my story, I'm fighting. I became four-time world champion. Uh, I was 28 when I won my fourth world title. And one day I woke up and I literally just woke up. I looked at my bank. I like, I mean, I just won a world title fight, but I hadn't fought in six months. By the time I paid all my back rent and paid my car payments, all that, I looked at my bank. I had like three grand, four grand in there. And I'm like, I'm giving up my entire life and I, I don't even know how I'm gonna live. I need to get rich. I want to get rich. So I said to my coach, look, I'm gonna take a couple months off and I'm gonna focus purely on money. And the story is, and this is a completely true story, I'm sitting with my brother and I'm like, how can we get rich? You know what's amazing? Lots of, now I have money, lots of people always ask me, how do I get rich? And I say, when's the last time you talked about money? When's the last time you sat down with your friends and refused to talk about anything else but how to make money. How are you making money? How are you making money? How am I making money? How can we make money together? How's that guy making money? How's that coffee shop there making money? Is that coffee shop making money? I don't know, do they sell cake? No, why don't they sell cake? Everyone in here is a businessman. If they had a, a cute young waitress, a girl, instead of a guy, they'd probably sell more coffee. Like no one analyzes anything. They just wanna get rich. 
right? I want to be rich, but they have no plan to get rich. And a hope and a plan are very different things. I explain this to people all the time. Everyone has a dream, but no one has a plan. And nothing good is going to happen on accident, right? I didn't become world champion on accident. I didn't wake up and someone go, how'd you become world champion? And I went, oops, you, you have to plan for it. So I said to Tristan, we need to discuss money. We need to plan this and we need to work out a way we can get rich. And that's when I started analyzing and understanding banks and the, the, the credit system and the money system, how the world actually works. And then I got really pissed off because I realized that money isn't real and it's all a scam. <laughs> and the banks are destroying us in real time with inflation. And I still don't have any. So I was really mad. And uh, I'm writing down, I was reading, I was watching some YouTube videos, like financial advice, and we're talking about assets, liabilities, etc. And I'm writing down all my assets and I'm trying to work out what I have that's worth money. And the only thing I wrote down, because I had a car, but what's that worth? Nothing. I'm, I'm big and strong, but I'm already fighting. I can't think of anything else to do with that. The only thing I had was, because I'd been fighting all around the world, I had these six girlfriends, right? Because you'd win the world title, you fuck a ring girl, she falls in love with you, you're the big millionaire in London, of course, she thinks, she thinks you're living the balling life, you're in some <laughs> tiny, <laughs> tiny apartment with a door lock. So, um, I had these girlfriends and I thought, well, I can't open a strip club. It costs money to open a strip club. And I'm kind of racking my brain and by absolute coincidence, I'm going around the internet and I saw in the corner, talk to live girls now. And I'd never in my life, like I was never a porn guy. I've never been watching porn or clicking on these things. And I said, talk to live girls. So I clicked on it and there's some chick there on a computer, like, hi, and I was like, my girls can do that. So that, that was the very beginning. That was the eureka moment. And I walked into my, my brother's bedroom and I said, we're gonna start a webcam company. Yeah, so, and this is the thing that's interesting about it. Cause when people hear this story and they say like a pimp, et cetera, people imagine me to be this exploitive, horrible, evil man, which is absolutely and utterly the complete opposite. I'm not trying to convince the internet I'm a nice guy, right? Cause I don't give a shit. I'm just telling the truth. So the beginning of it was I messaged my six girlfriends and told them they're all coming to live with me and I had a job for them in London. Uh, two of them wouldn't come, four of them agreed. And I was like, we're gonna make money, load money up, a bunch of money, you're gonna live with me, blah, 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 we're gonna live the dream. Right now I'm in between apartments, so I'm in this shitty apartment. <laughs> you know, because kickboxing's not boxing, bro. You're not making millions like the boxers are. So the four girls flew in, I sat them all down at a table, they're all like, who's this chick, who's this chick? Told them all the truth. I just straight sat there, just sat there and said, listen, I've been with you all, I'm starting a webcam business, I'm gonna get rich. Some of you are gonna come with me to the top of the mountain, or if you're pissed off, you can fucking fly home. Just very matter of fact to the point, because I needed money at this point. Now I have not agreed to take another fight. I need money now. So uh, two of them left, two of them agreed to stay. And the beginning of my cam empire was this tiny little apartment, me and my two girlfriends living in this house, right? Um, and they went on cam together as a duo, as a team to start making money. And that was the beginning of it. And the interesting, about it, the interesting thing about it was these girls were so inept from a business perspective. Like they are very beautiful and they're nice girls. I so can't say anything bad about them, but they were not, women do not have a business mind. So they'd sit on webcam, right? And a, an old dude would sit there and the old dude would say, what kind of guy do you like? And they'd say, oh, I don't know, someone in shape who's rich and young. And I'm like, no, no, he's an old dude. You have to say, I'm tired of these young guys messing me around. I need an older guy who's ready to settle down. I don't care if he has money as long as he'll take care of me. Da -da. If he's a young guy, you say, I'm tired of these old guys perving on me. You need to sell the dream. So I'm, I'm, I'm training these girls. And it got to the point where it was easier if I just typed myself. So what we ended up doing was we had the two girls on camera with a keyboard, which wasn't plugged in doing this. And then I was behind the screen talking to the dudes saying the right things and start dragging money out the internet. And for me, I mean, this is a long time ago, right? This is about, how old am I now? I'm 34, so I was about 28. So about six, seven, maybe eight years ago, right? And making money online nowadays is far more popular than it was even eight years ago. Who do you know eight years ago who made money from YouTube or from online? Yeah, no, nobody. It's just booming, it's, it's, just, starting, it's yeah. just starting. So the four girls flew in, I sat them all down at a table. They're all like, who's this chick? Who's this chick? Told them all the truth. I just straight sat there, just sat there and said, listen, I've been with you all. I'm starting a webcam business. I'm going to get rich. Some of you are going to come with me to the top of the mountain, or if you're pissed off, you can fucking fly home. So a woman can't go around fucking people and pretend it's the same as a man running around fucking people. It's absolutely not the same. If I, a man can only cheat if he loves someone else. If I have a woman who I truly love and I go out and fuck and I come back to her and I don't care about her and I only love my girl, that's not cheating. That's exercise. If she even talks to a dude, it's cheating. 
because females are emotionally invested. I have no emotional investment. So no, I'm making this very, very clear. Any woman who was with me never, never even, the only men they spoke to besides me were my brother, hi, and the guys online who were paying them. That is it. They were absolutely loyal to me. And if they weren't, they got fired. And any feminist will disagree with me, but I'll tell you something. Women are loyal to one thing on the planet. And the only thing they're loyal to is, is the man they want to have sex with. So every time there was a girl who I wasn't sleeping with, she never lasted long. So then I had these four big premises, all these overheads, all these managers that got out of control. So I cut down to like a special forces team of around eight girls. And that's where I made my most money. When I had four girlfriends, my brother had four girlfriends, me, my brother, eight women living in one house and all the women adored us and they obeyed us. And at the peak, I was turning over 400 grand a month. Only an English or an American girl is stupid enough to be a hoe for free. Because over here, they'll be a hoe because they were drunk. They'll just be a hoe because they're dumb. Oh, I slept with a bunch of men. Oh, he was funny. So he jizzed on me. Like, they're just idiots. In, the, in Eastern Europe, they're far too intelligent for that. They understand that the number one commodity a female has is beauty. And if they're born with it, they're not going to fucking waste it going out getting hammered and banging Joe whoever. They're not going to do that. They're not stupid like that. So Western girls are extremely easy to sleep with compared to Eastern European women. This is going to really piss the feminists off, but I'll tell you, it's the truth. It doesn't matter whether a woman wants to be a lawyer or a housemaker or a webcam girl. Unless she has a man directing her, she's going to fuck it up. They're just not built to be completely independent creatures. The women who go, I'm strong and independent. You're working for a man in a company and you're getting fucked by 10 men a month. You're not independent. It's just a lie. It's a lie. You're, just, you're just undesirable. That's what you are. There's no such thing as an independent female. They're all relying on a man to some degree. Maybe I'm completely crazy. Maybe I'm full of shit, like you said. Ghetto friends, eight ghetto friends. You're making my life sound very, very interesting. <laughs> you're making my life sound good. Yeah, I do okay, man. I do okay. I just try and live as, as close as I, as I can to my masculine imperative without hiding who I want to be or what I want to do or letting society program me. And I think if you let, if you give a man true free reign, completely be who you want to be and you don't let society program you, he's gonna drive a fast car, he's gonna have a bunch of women, he's gonna to wanna to have a bunch of money, he's gonna do whatever he wants, right? We all wanna be free. So I try my very best to be free. What is free to you? That's a good question. And especially in the modern political climate with all this corona, et cetera, et cetera, I think freedom is being destroyed in real time. Even before corona, freedom is being destroyed. You, we, if, if you look at even very basic things, right? Like freedom of speech. If a man isn't free to say what he thinks in the way he wants to say it, if political correctness or hate speech or whatever, whatever, if a man can't even express himself the way he thinks it, is he free? You know? And what they do first is they restrict your speech because if they restrict your speech, then they can start to restrict your thoughts. If you're not allowed to ever say it, then you're probably not gonna think it so often. This is why it's done on purpose. So I don't think that society is very free at all. And I think that in, in regards to keeping our employment, keeping our money coming in, making sure we don't lose our social medias. Every single person has to censor themselves to some degree. And I try very, very best to skirt that line, you know, as far as possible. So I feel free. Freedom is the ability to scream when you want to scream, be angry when you want to be angry, smile when you want to smile, say what you want, do what you want. And, and that's a very, very rare commodity in the modern world. That's extremely rare. So that's what I would consider free. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I am uh, half English, half American. My father was in the Air Force. He was based at Chick Sands in the UK. He met my mother. Uh, they were fortunate enough to have this perfect child you see in front of you. <laughs> I have a brother. I have a brother and a sister. We moved back to America, and I lived the first ten years of my life in the in, in the United States. And my father was a chess master. That was his job. After he retired from the Air Force, he's a professional chess player. So I grew up around professional chess players, which is kind of an unusual climate to grow up in, because you're growing up around all these ultra intelligent, semi autistic. They're weirdos, right? Yeah. You, you, can't yeah. be, you can't be that good at chess and be normal, right? It's the, they're like human calculators. They're all a bit strange. And you have ex-KGB members and like math nerds. And it's just a very weird kind of climate. And my father was a chess master, but my father was very unique because my father was also a professional wrestler and had physicality. So you have like a bunch of dorks. Then you have my dad, this big black dude, and he's like competing in the chess world. So I grew up in a very kind of strange world and I was a professional chess player. I was on my path to being a professional chess player. At the age of five, I was the state chess champion for Indiana and I was the best ranked player under the age of 10 and I was on my way. So I played chess for the early part of my life and then at the age of 11, my mother and father split up. My mom took me back to uh, Luton, great place. Lovely. Mm -hmm. so, so from the age of 11, I grew up in Luton. So that's the very beginning of the story. And uh, 
a lot's happened between now and then, and here I am. Yeah, that's a good question. And a lot of people talk about how stressful it was that their parents broke up. And I mean, obviously I was very, very young. I don't think I was necessarily too upset by it. You know, I was, I was still, my father was very realistic with me and he said, look, I'm still gonna see you, but you're going to England. It is what it is. So I don't think I was particularly upset by it. I would definitely wouldn't say I was traumatized by it, but it did alter my life project tra trajectory because I lost my chess coach. Up until then, I played chess three, four hours a day. It's all I did was chess, chess, chess. When we left, not only is there no chess scene in England like there's in America. In America, there's lots of chess in the schools and these kind of things. There's no chess scene, plus I had no coach. So for a while, I was kind of lost, I would say. I had four hours free a day that I never used to previously have. And uh, I mean, I didn't get into too much trouble or too much mischief, but I was certainly a bit, how can I replace this thing I used to do all of the time? What got you to replace it with? I ended up replacing it with fighting. Yeah, from a young age? From, from around about 15, 16, I started kickboxing. And I think that fighting and chess are extremely similar. To me, they, they aligned. They fulfilled the same gaps in my psyche, right? People always say, how did you go from being a chess player, which everyone sees as geeky, to a kickboxer? And I said, well, chess is chess is one-on-one -on -one battle, right? That's all it is. There's no luck involved. There's no team. There's no wind that can blow the ball. There's no, you know, it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's a fight. If you lose, you messed up. And fighting feels the same for me. So for me, I thought, well, okay, I, I can't learn chess well enough without a coach. And I can't find a coach in the UK who I trust to teach me chess, but I can find a coach who can teach me to kick people's ass. So that's kind of how, how it started. How did you end up going through the ranks and winning world titles? Fighting's kind of weird, right? Every, I think if you talk to any fighter, everyone who starts, I mean, lots of people say they had aspirations of being the world title or the world champion at the beginning. I just turned up to training one step at a time, right? I just wanted to be good. So my coach said, you have to train seven times a week. I said, okay. So I just obeyed. I was just a worker ant. I just did as I was told. And then you win and you win again and you win again and you get a title shot, you win. And before you know it, you get up there. My first ever world title fight was on three days notice. So someone pulled out and I had three days notice. I had to lose nine kilo in three days. I turned up, obviously was completely destroyed from the weight cut. Everyone expected me to lose. And uh, I won. But they gave the, and I'll say I won because I did win. They gave the decision to the other guy. It was in France and it was in Paris and it was me against the French world champion. They gave it to him. But I whooped his ass, right? And we submitted the video to the ISKA, the organization, and they demanded a rematch because it was so obvious I won. And we fought again. And without the big weight cut problem, I, I, I knocked him out in the eighth. You know, violence is a very different thing. And women don't understand the difference between fighting and pure violence. And they also, you're completely right, they don't understand the true physical difference between a man and a woman. Yeah. All this female self-defense, I can fight to, is all bullshit. Mm -hmm. It's complete garbage. A man who's genuinely enraged, you don't stand a chance. I'm sorry. The best thing you can do is scream and run. I'll tell you another example. Even a teenage boy. Oh, no. You don't destroy a, a grown yeah. woman. I had a girl who did uh, self-defense classes. This is like a couple years ago. And she goes, oh, you're a kickboxer. I want to show you like my self-defense. And if you grab me, I do this, I do this, I do this. I said, listen, bitch. <laughs> if I grab you and you start trying to be a little ninja, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fucking smash you. Whack, 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 whack. Done. Now your whole face is busted. Like you, you, you're forgetting the, the part of the equation where I just beat you up for like three seconds and you're done. Now drag your ass to the bushes. What the fuck you talking about? It's garbage, man. I'll give you another example of a guy I saw get fucked up because of his chick. I was outside a club in England. And one more thing for the American guys watching this. Anyone who thinks England's like, you know, nice suits and little posh people. England, Shanks. Hey, bro, England's violent. Very dangerous. Shanks, Shanks, very, very, very dangerous. Yeah. I would actually say, although you have guns here, I'd say the mentality as a whole is more dangerous there. People are about it. They're just a crazy island, and they always have been. So it's a very dangerous place. Chef, yeah, yeah. Chef G. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have it missing here. I don't know if you can zoom in. My finger came off from a blade. Oh, All shit. All the way off, yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's a long story. I was walking to a car late at night. I was arguing with the, I don't know if you can see the scar there. I had yeah. to be sewn back on. God damn. So uh, I, I'm mixing stories now, but yeah, I, was, no, I, I had arguments with the guy by text. He stopped replying. Two days later, as I walked to my car at night, they tried to kill me. And that also shows a lot about intent, right? Because when they, with intent, they don't threaten. That shows you how, you know, I was arguing with the guy and he goes, all right, he just stopped replying. And that shows true intent because he tried to kill me. That's another story I can't say on Fresh and Fit. But uh, <laughs> I, I saw a dude get knocked the fuck out again. Even when women have the best intentions, they're a liability. I saw a guy outside a nightclub. He's arguing with another guy. His chick's in the way going, leave it, leave it, stop, stop, don't do it. Da, da. Be in the way, being a fucking idiot. Anyway, she holds, she grabs her guy. Like, go, oh, stop, stop. Holds onto his right arm. Stop, stop. Boom, he gets knocked out. You're holding on your dude's arm. How the fuck's he going to fight? Even if you don't want him to fight, you're just going to hold on his arm saying, stop, 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 and let him get sparked. 
I tell my chicks all the time, if we're walking down the street and any kind of altercation comes, run and fucking scream. Fuck off. You're no good to me next to me. You're, you're no good to me in between. You're no good to me next to me. You're no good to me shouting stop. You're no good to me holding on to me. Just fuck off. Run over there and scream and get somebody else. And leave it to me. Even if there's a hundred of them, leave me by myself. Because these chicks will get you fucked up, especially the ones who aren't trained. And even if they have the best intentions, if they panic, what are they going to do? They're going to grab you. Because you're their man, right? Oh, oh, oh. They're going to stop you from being able to fight. Yeah. They're a fucking liability. Dude, you're walking out here with chicks and they're untrained. At least my chicks are trained. I literally will sit down with girls and say, look, if something goes off, especially where I live in the world, Romania, these kind of countries, if something goes off, run and scream. Should, I, should I tell you the story quickly? Yeah, tell us the story on that one. All right. So I'm with my dad. My dad, my dad's a chess player, but he's also like a park hustler, right? So like he'd go to the, the parks and play chess against the other chess guys to make quick money. So we'd go in there and offer him ridiculous odds, like three to one, four to one, give them more time, whatever. And he'd sit down in the park and he'd, and he'd bust them up. My dad was really good at chess, but he was ultra aggressive. So like grandmasters hated playing him. A few times he lost spectacularly because he went too hard, but there's some few times he had crushing victories, like just wrecked a grandmaster because he just went completely all out defenseless. He was like an attacking player. Damn. So uh, I remember I was about eight years old. I told this story on my Tate speech, my YouTube channel. I was about eight years old. Yeah, I read it and I was like, that's definitely your father's Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of. I was about eight years old. And my dad, even when he was still alive, because I only speak English, right? Even though I live in Romania. And I said to my dad, do you think I should learn another language? And he sat, he turned to me and said, you don't even speak English. And what he meant is most people don't even have a, a grasp of the English language. Think how many words are in English you don't even know, right? So his, what he was saying to me is you don't need to learn anything else. You need to learn English, mm -hmm. which was funny. But my father spoke a very particular brand of English. And that's what this story is about. So it was Detroit. It was three in the morning. We were in a gas station. I was walking around. I remember looking at the Cheetos. I'm eight. Who doesn't like Cheetos? <laughs> and I heard an altercation near the front near the front of the till. I heard like some scuffling, etc. I don't know what exactly happened, but I came to the front and my dad was getting jumped by four Mexican guys. Right? So they're hitting him, bang, bang. One of them got a bottle, start smashing him. They're beating the shit out of him. Even as my dad was getting his ass kicked, I'm eight, I'm standing there just frozen. As he was getting his ass kicked, he turned to me and I remember he almost, he growled at me and he went, run to me as he was getting beaten, right? He managed to get one of them and hold him tight and must have bit in his face because or whatever he bit, he had flesh in his mouth by the time the whole thing was done, right? So he bit something off. So there's blood everywhere. Anyway, the shopkeeper starts screaming, so he's going to call the police. It kind of starts tussling, goes half outside. My dad manages to stay inside. The, the Mexican guys run off. My dad's covered in blood. His head's cut. He bit that guy's, I think he bit the guy's lip off. Mm -hmm. So there's blood all down the face. And he's absolutely covered in blood. He's drenched in blood. And I'm standing by the drinks cabinet, still just standing there. So he told me to run. So what the fuck are you going to run in a 7-Eleven? So I'm just standing by the drinks cabinet. He said, son, son. So I came over there and my dad's standing there. He's talking to the shopkeeper. The shopkeeper was Korean saying, it wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, police come and the police look through the CCTV. They see that my dad fought all these guys off. And the police officer said, so what's your job? What do you do? And he was taking the, the statement. My dad said, I'm a chess player. And the police officer said, chess player? Maybe you should be something else. And my dad replied, my unmatched perspicacity coupled with sheer indefatigability makes me a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. Right <laughs> in the report. But what my dad was saying, unmatched perspicacity. Perspicacity, perspicacity is the ability to perceive, right? Perception. My unmatched perception. Indefatigability is the ability to, is the inability to become tired. So he's saying I have unmatched perception and I never become tired and that's why I'm a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. And I remember that quote from when I was eight years old. Wow. That's a badass way to talk. I'm yeah, jealous to this God day. Damn. People think I'm good on my podcast. That's how my dad just spoke through life. He just been rattled to the brain. And that's how he gives a police report. Like the, yeah, my unmatched perspicacity coupled with sheer indefatigability makes me a feared opponent in any realm of human endeavor. Yeah. Damn. So when I was a child, I was playing chess all the time with my father. I was a state chess champion of Indiana. I was on my way to become a grandmaster. And then when my, uh, mother and father decided to break up we decided to move back to england because england has a social housing social housing program right in america you're broke you're broke but in england you can get a house you get a bit of food that kind of stuff it's actually kind of crazy not to get political but americans especially the conservatives are constantly harping on about we don't want this to become a socialist country and they call europe socialist countries but the tax rate in england is about the same as here wow. and there you get free health care 
a free house if you're broke. But uh, here, what do they give you in America? Nothing. They're too busy bombing countries. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> Stupid. So um, yeah. So we moved back over there. My and dad, Andrew is American for you guys that are. I'm wondering. American. Yeah. He's I'm American, American yeah. and he's British, guys. Yeah. Both. So I'm half half. So uh, my dad stayed here in America. So I lost my chess coach. And uh, it's hard to stay dedicated and stay good without a coach, right? So right. for a long time, I played a bit of chess. I did a little bit back and forth, etc. And when I realized I needed probably 13, 14, I was missing all that time I spent playing chess. I was looking for something that was similar, and I ended up choosing fighting. I started with karate. I got a black belt in Shotokan, and I moved on to kickboxing. And I fought K1, and I've had MMA fights as well. So to me, they're very, very similar. They're one-on-one. -on -one. There's no luck involved. Uh, I don't really like, I didn't want a team sport because in a team sport, you can have a bad day, still win a good day, still lose. No, I want it all on the line, right? I didn't want a sport with any luck. That's the thing about chess. It doesn't matter how well you played. It doesn't matter how nearly perfect the game was. If you lost at some point, you made a mistake. Even if you can't identify it at some point, you have made a mistake. And that's a fantastic metaphor for life as well. Cause there's so many people out here who don't take responsibility and they'll come along and go, well, COVID happened. That's why I lost all my money. No. I don't buy that. I don't give a shit what happened. At some point, you did not diversify. You did not prepare yourself. You made a mistake.